So uh, a lot of my work has grown out of a very early experience in my career of doing research in uh, West African settings, in Ghana in particular. And so as a result of that experience, one of the things that has um, impacted me in my thinking is how does one change what thinks, psycholo what thinks psychology is from a uh, West African or an African perspective? And how does the enterprise change? And uh, eventually, in conversation with other scholars, it became uh, one way of talking about this is the phrase of decolonization or decoloniality. So I think that it's a very common topic in a South African setting, of course, one of the sites where people have interrogated the notion the most, especially in psychology, I think. Uh, not very many other places in psych uh, where people have done it within psychology. And I think that um, one way of understanding the decolonial project, and especially in a South African context, I think is uh, something you might call en endogenous or indigenous resistance. So this idea of um, the, the psychology that we have or the knowledge that we have has come from outside, it's been imposed on us, it doesn't suit our purposes, and in some cases performs what uh, Thomas Teo calls epistemological violence. It's uh, the way of explaining events uh, harms us in some material and substantial ways. And if that's the conception of decolonization, and, and it is an important one, then an important remedy or response is resistance, endogenous resistance. And then this is a way in which African psychologies play an important role, or, or not just African psychologies as a kind of what is Africanness, but psychologies that, that emerge from the lived experience of people in African settings. Uh, what are the everyday concepts through which people live their lives as alternatives to the, the hegemonic knowledge coming from outside? So that's a very important way of understanding uh, the decolonial project. Uh, but in my work, it's not really the way I approach it because I'm not positioned in a way to do that. It's not so much like I'm part of a local community is feeling some kind of imposition. It's more um, uh, related to this idea of coloniality that scholars who are talking about decolonial theory uh, emphasize. And this notion suggests that you can't really talk about the modern order and you can't really talk about modern ways of being, and this is important for psychologists, unless you talk about their roots in coloniality, uh, their roots in the colonial encounter, the ways that, that the concept of the person in psychology, which we might think of as just neutral and just natural, is the product of the racial encounter. And, and, and by re-inscribing this conception of the person in our work, uh, we reinscribe the colonial violence that that conception does. It, the, the coloniality of it, I think, comes in because um, a characteristic feature of this notion of the person is the idea of being separate from context or being free from constraint and able to do things. Well, I would suggest, or the decolonial scholars suggest, that this ability is a form of enablement, that it came from somewhere. It's not naturally inherent in the person, but it came through the appropriation of others' capacity. And when we recognize that, then we understand that we need to, in some sense, decolonize the, f the standard knowledge in psychology. Not only when we're bringing it to some place like a South African context, but also and especially when we're applying it in the place where I teach, at the University of Kansas, with, with people who might not understand themselves as colonial subjects, but uh, to reveal how we are working with and reproducing a colonial form at the center of the discipline. Well, this raises a question of what constitutes practice, and for somebody uh, in the position that I'm in, I think that practice, a big part of practice is uh, the delivery of research, um, not as a kind of here is this thing about the world, but as a kind of pedagogical exercise, and then the more typical pedagogical exercise of teaching. And I think a very, uh, the way that I approach it is to sort of tell stories with research, or think about research in a way that can tell a story. And so uh, an example, or a couple examples, would be research that arises from uh, work that I did in a Ghanaian context. So one, both of them seem like very kind of silly almost, or simple incidents in ev the everyday world. One, in one set of studies, I ask people, um, to what extent do they think they have enemies? Um, in another study, we ask people to make a d d dilemma, we present them with a dilemma of care. The idea is that a couple of loved ones, a mother and a spouse, uh, are require care, but they don't have enough resources to care for both. What kind of choice would they make? Who would they prioritize over another person? So these are kind of everyday questions and incidents. And, and the, the point is, uh, 
or, or the way that, that the research works, uh, people in a Ghanaian context where I conduct the research typically say that they think they might have the they might have enemies, and they typically prioritize care to mother over spouse. And both of these patterns tend to be th things I that the field of psychology sees in pathologizing light as some kind of either irrationality or immaturity or lack of, of psychological development, but then it implies a kind of community development as well. Well, certainly, and not, but not in the way of necessarily of a, a, you know, a kind of frozen or reified traditional thing that we could point to, but rather how to take uh, lived experience in an African context and use it as a standpoint from which to consider the, the, the larger general psychology. So it's not about a particular African psychology, but rather using African epistemic standpoints to understand psychology in general. And to continue with the research example, the way that I would do that and do it in my classes is to say, look, hegemonic or standard or mainstream psychology tends to look on these African responses as somehow immature. But if we look at this response from an African epistemic framework, we can do two things. First of all, to show the the maturity, the adaptability, the, the goodness the, uh, of the responses in an African context. So rather than um, some kind of pathology, the tendency to believe that you have enemies uh, is actually a reflection of social embeddedness and an attention to obligation and a realization that one is not going to be able to handle all those obligations and there's going to be friction as a result. So this is one part of the story to sort of depathologize the pathologizing narratives of African context. But the more important, I think, for my purposes part of the story is to use, again, the African epistemic location to rethink what the, the sort of standard knowledge of what people think is true about people in general or what is good in general. And so using this framework, one can look at that tendency of people in American context to say that they don't have enemies, not as a just natural feature of the way people are or the tendency to uh, say that one uh, will prioritize spouse over mother, not as an evidence of maturity, but ra rather as a particular response based on a particular cultural and structural position, which is this modern individual notion. People think they don't have enemies because they have the delusion that they're free to avoid them. And they in choose to prioritize spouse over mother because this is the kind of relationship that affirms their sort of personal aspirations. So the point of that would be to say, first of all, this is not just natural, it comes from somewhere. And the place that it comes from is one that is problematic. If it's rooted in modern individualism, it's rooted in coloniality, and we can think about it as problematic because of its source in colonial violence or because of its consequences. The prioritization of spouse over broader connections contributes to a kind of nuclearization or narrowing of care. The tendency to believe that you don't have enemies means you move through the world without considering the consequences of your actions on other people. And I think at the kind of extreme, that's what gets us into the ecological crisis that we're in right now. People believing that they can act and fulfill their own personal needs without um, worrying about the implications for broader collectives.